This original WSRE presentation is made possible by viewers like you. Thank you. It's something we hear more and more about, meditation. In fact, you might even say meditation has gone mainstream. Has it? We'll discuss that and more in Studio Begins right now. The art and practice of meditation is ancient. The exact date of meditation's origin is not known, but most scholars and architects agree that it's been around for at least 5,000 years. We're hearing a great deal about meditation these days and le learning that our family, friends, and business colleagues are meditating. Many of you may be meditating. Still others are wondering what exactly meditation is and why it's become so popular. Has meditation indeed gone mainstream? Here to talk about that is someone who has been hoping that would happen for over three decades and has done so much to further that cause, Dr. Michael DeMaria. Dr. DeMaria is on a mission to help guide others to what he calls the ocean of peace that lies within each human heart. He does this work as an integrative wellness consultant, yoga, meditation teacher, and above all, as a musician. In fact, his music is heard over a quarter of a million times each week across the globe. And Dr. Di Maria has numerous awards for his music, including four Grammy nominations, six number one albums, and more. He's also the author of four books, three of them bestsellers. We welcome Dr. Michael Brandt Di Maria to In Studio. And I mean that. And mm. I said so much about you leading into this, and there's a lot more, because I want our viewers to know who you are, what you've been doing. You know, Pensacola keeps growing and growing, doesn't it? And we get new people and then people go and not everybody knows everybody, so. It's so true and it's just a joy to be here, Sherry. I always love what you do within studio and it's an honor to be here. And you're right, I have been waiting three decades <laughs> for meditation mm -hmm. to show up more mainstream like it's doing. Right, what do you think has been contributing to that? a lot of things mm -hmm. you know there's I think things reached a tipping point you know meditation as you mentioned is ancient I mean going back 5,000 years every culture has some form of what we might think of as meditation and the research the science as well as just getting into popular culture has reached a point where all of a sudden we're realizing there really are great benefits and I think we just people understand what meditation is more than they used to, and they understand the benefits of it, particularly in today's high stress situations that we are yeah. living in. Yeah, isn't that true? Well, now you got involved in this in like, what, 1993? Or you went no. on a vision quest or earlier than that? Oh, I, 18. Um, oh, you I were was, 18? Yeah, when I, so 19, gosh, that'll date me, <laughs> 1980. Yeah, um, so a while. 1982, mm -hmm. uh, when I first formally learned mm -hmm. how to meditate. Okay. But I realized I was probably doing this since I was seven years old after mm -hmm. a difficult abdominal surgery. I would hit one note on the piano at a time, close my eyes, and let that note dissipate off into silence. Wow. And then I would do it over and over again. And I, looking back on it, as a psychologist, I realized I was self-soothing, but I was also meditating with sound. And I think some children do this naturally, um, but it's really powerful because it really helped me deal with a lot of the disconnection and trauma I had from the surgery. But many years later, I learned what it was to formally meditate in a class here at University of West Florida with Dr. Michaelis, mm -hmm. who's been a meditation teacher for me for 36 years. Wow. And he's around and he's doing that now? Yes. yes, and we still, we met last week and we meditate an hour or two together when we're, whenever we get together. He's retired now, but he has turned a lot of people onto meditation in this area. And again, it's it's been around a lot. What you're referring to in 1993 mm -hmm. was what, what is called a, a vision quest. Okay. And it's really wonderful to realize that this was a Native American process that involves meditation a three-day meditation mm. without food or water. Um, so I was really glad I had actually 10, 11 years 
of meditation practice mm -hmm. just so I didn't go insane no. when I was out there. I would imagine that would be easy to do. Why would somebody put themselves in that position? Well, what's called a vision quest, actually the native word, hemblechiape, means the lament or the lament in the wild. And all cultures, again, traditional cultures or indigenous cultures have some form of what we would call a rite of passage. And most of these rites of passage usually involve solitude, nature, exposure to the elements. And their understanding to become a true adult that you have to really get to know yourself and be really quiet with yourself. Um, one of the understandings in Native American culture is what they would call sacred silence, entering sacred silence, which is really just meditation. Mm -hmm. It's quieting your mind, opening your heart, being present in the moment to something greater. With the vision quest, you're actually also listening for a vision for your life, a sense of a direction for your life. So most cultures, somewhere between 15 and 25, you do some form of a rite of passage that would help tell you kind of why, why you're here, what your inborn gifts are, so you can give them to your people, bring them back to your people. And having that time of solitude, so you're, you're tuning out all the noise from your parents, mm -hmm. from culture, from teachers, and really getting quiet with yourself. And that's what we actually do, even when people begin to meditate. Sure, there's all kinds, and we'll talk about this, physiological benefits, psychological benefits, but it also helps you get to know yourself more deeply, who you really are underneath all of those, all that mind chatter. And that's what really gives us a sense of, I think of it as heart-centered, soulful living, because we get in touch with something more essential inside of ourselves, and it makes you more resilient, it makes you more creative. It helps you feel more capable of connecting with others. Um, I don't think I would have had the guts to put my music out there if I wasn't able to tune out all the negative self-talk that kept me from doing it for so many years. Yeah, that's amazing. So most people don't do a vision quest. Um, they just, they don't. So when, you know, you're 13, 15, and you're in this culture, you just, boom, go straight into life, and maybe sometimes don't even get to know yourself until later. How important could it be for all of our youth to have some version of that, whether it's 20 minutes in school? Oh, that's one of my huge missions on the planet. There was a, a book that came out years ago called The Sibling Society. And the message of that book is that we don't have elders, or we really don't have mature psychological adults in our culture for the most part. I mean, look who's running much of the show sometimes, that we can get very discouraged because we don't know who we are in a deeper way. So I feel all kids, a lot of the adolescent storm and stress could really be eliminated or at least reduced if kids could have a very meaningful rite of passage and give them that chance before they jump into college because most people are doing what a teacher or a parent wants them to do or they think will make money but really having a sense of a sense of direction and mission that comes from deep down inside a why you know to their life that feels deeply personal to them because you know being also a psychologist for 30 years, I see so many people in their 40s and 50s that come to me and they get to the top of the ladder and they say it's against the wrong wall. They say, you know, I didn't, I'm not happy. You know, I have money in the bank, but I'm not happy. So that's when we do things more from this place of heart or soul that I like to talk about. And meditation, even a simple meditation can help us get there, but you could think of a rite of passage is a massive dose of that meditation. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that's just amazing. So then you went into psychology mm -hmm. and you had a lot of clients and th throughout it all, were you practicing your music? How did your music become your your source, your your means to identify with people? And Well, it, that's a great question, Sherry. And it, it bears to, to reflect on just what I talked about because when I was 18, I really, I told my parents I wanted to be a musician. I really wanted to explore music. And my father was an immigrant from Italy, you know, came here with nothing at 20 and, you know, selling rags in the streets of Brooklyn. My mom grew up in foster homes. And, and I was told by my dad, no uncertain terms, you're going to be a doctor. Your kids can be musicians. Um, 
so I was trying to figure what kind of doctor can I be <laughs> and still explore music. And I heard about music therapy, et cetera. So I explored that, but I didn't share my, my music for many years. I was doing relaxation tapes and meditation tapes for my clients. And I would do my own soundtracks. And I was really more interested in that <laughs> probably than anything. But it was on my vision quest that I first heard this, the Native American flute. And it just broke my heart open. And when I was out there, no food, no water, n nothing to distract me. I, I really connected with that deep wellspring of love and care and connection to music. And I found myself singing and chanting out there. And it was like very much a sense of a vision of sharing my music. Um, it was still almost 10 years till I, I actually had the courage to produce my first album. Um, you know, so it really, though, was a way of bridging those worlds of healing and music and art and psychology. And to this day, my music is primarily for healing and meditation. You'll, you know, hear people going and say, well, I went to a massage yesterday, music <laughs> came, came on, or I was on, in a spa in Alaska and I heard your music, or I went to a meditation class in California and your music came on Pandora. So, which thrills me, and because I meditate while I'm playing, it's a form of meditation, a, a, a form of sound-based meditation, which I was doing at seven when I was mm -hmm. hitting mm -hmm. that one note at a time. My parents just thought I was autistic, but <laughs> I, was, I was really You were meditating. figuring it yeah, out. I was figuring it out. Well, and so then you've been able to take certain sounds to evoke certain types of emotions in people. I'm putting words in your mouth, but it's kind of sounding that way. Yeah, I think that's accurate. There's such a movement now even called sound healing. I have a yoga therapy sound healing room at my office. I do sometimes just a sound healing practice um, or session. And it's deeply meditative. It's like a sound bath or a sound massage. So there, I, I play a lot of different instruments um, from percussion to flutes to didgeridoos to these singing bowls. Um, and there's a long tradition actually. I mean, Christian and Hindu and Buddhist and Muslim, almost all traditions, spiritual traditions for the prayer meditation involve music. Right? right, and and so many times it's the, it's the chime, it's the gong, it's the bells, it's the, and all of this is actually helping shift consciousness, and really help us be very present in the moment, get us out of our heads, and into our hearts. I always love the Cherokee have a beautiful phrase that, the longest journey you will ever make is from your head to your heart, oh. and that's part of what we're doing with meditation. Can anybody? I'm just going to say this real quick. I have a minute to break, but. Is this wellspring available to every single person on the planet? Yes, absolutely. My, my experience, it's not just a belief, it's a knowing <clears throat> that deep within the human heart there is a spring of peace, an ocean of peace. And it has a lot to do with being able to really quiet the mind, open the heart, and this ocean of peace is there just waiting for you. You experience it. Everyone experiences it every night in deep, dreamless sleep. So even at sleep, I tell people at the very least, you're meditating six to eight hours a day when you're sleeping. And this is the time when our bodies and minds and hearts are restoring themselves physiologically, emotionally, spiritually, psychologically. So meditation is simply a way of practicing that during the day, but it's there. We all have this ocean of peace. It's where we come from and it's where we go back to is, is my experience. And it's learning to get there and we'll talk more about that coming up. When we come back, more on the modern practice of meditation, including some of the science behind just how it works. You're watching in studio on WSRE TV, PBS for the Gulf Coast. We'll be right back.
This is In Studio on WSRE-TV, PBS for the Gulf Coast. Our topic, Meditation Goes Mainstream. Our special guest, Dr. Michael DeMaria, a teacher of meditation and yoga, musician, author, and integrative wellness consultant. And so we've kind of been talking about meditation. I just want people that are viewing to be able to know that this isn't something that we're just sitting here talking about that um, that you understand that's out here that that's not attainable right. for them because there are so many ways to get to a meditation practice these days. What are, what are some of the simplest? Well, the, the the one I do with everyone is actually three breaths to de-stress. And this is one of the things that I learned even when I was a musician with my flutes because my warm up is to do three deep long breaths and just and then breathing back in. And so this three breath meditation can really simply in, th in three short breaths begin to reduce stress and strain. Part of what we know in meditation practice is that if our respiration drops, okay, just from a scientific point, you drop away all the, the religious, spiritual background or whatever, that has nothing to do with ultimately why meditation works. And people actually are medita meditating whenever they're, they're in the present moment, they're being able to focus on one thing and they're relaxing. So just doing three breaths slows your respiration rate. When your respiration rate drops about be to seven to eight breaths a minute when it's usually 12 to 15, in our usual breathing during the day when that respiration rate, the sympathetic nervous system kicks in, which is our fight or flight. Mm -hmm. And unfortunately in our culture, most people are in that fight or flight almost all day long. So when you drop your respiration rate, so just doing three breaths over 30 seconds or a minute, you immediately kicking the parasympathetic nervous system, which is the rest and digest. So there's this immediate relaxation response. Some people call meditation a relaxation response. The digestion slows, the mind slows, the heart rate slows, blood pressure slows, and all of a sudden there's just a sense of relaxation. You know, so even in my seven by seven meditation challenge, seven minutes a day for seven days, I hear from people all over the world like, oh my gosh, I just, you know, I do it every night now. Just, I can't believe in seven minutes how relaxed I feel. And so a deep breath can be a meditation, what I call release, just breathing, lifting your arms over your head and imagine letting go of everything that just happened and everything's going to happen. So... That what if sense. business, oh, it makes a lot of sense. What if businesses had a moment a couple of times a day where they said, okay, everybody, they're over the loudspeaker, time to breathe, take that breath. What, what do you think that would do for our productivity, for our employee relations, for all of the things that go with um, life and being in a business? We actually know it increases productivity. So there was a fascinating study that had people who were working eight hours straight with an hour lunch break. And then they took another group and they had them every 45 minutes take a 15 minute break to meditate, be quiet. I mean, not like drinking or smoking or anything, but walking nature was okay. But they took a 15 minute closing their eyes, relaxing. So they literally worked two hours less and they got like 20% more done. And they were happier, more peaceful, more humorous and interacted more. So we know, we know this is the case. We have in our minds this sense of workaholism that just like powering through or not taking a break, but actually our focus, our attention, and most importantly, our creativity begins to plummet. Yeah. Well, you're talking about the seven by seven meditation challenge. That's something that's free for people. Yes, it's on my YouTube channel. <laughs> you know, I have over 110,000 views in 171 countries from around the world. Seven minutes a day. For seven days, I guide you. It's free. You, I have people that still do it every day, even though after the seven minutes <laughs> is done. But we know seven minutes is kind of a key point, a turning point where you really begin to have a benefit from having quieting your mind, closing your eyes, deep breathing. And so I wanted to say, what's the simplest amount of time, the least amount of time I can get somebody to just begin to give it a, give it a shot? Mm -hmm. So... It, it is a totally free on my YouTube channel, 7x7 um, seven seven Meditation Challenge. 
I think that's wonderful because literally everybody that's watching or is going online or doing anything can pull that up. Everybody can find seven minutes in a day. I have to tell you, I put it on the other night and um, I have a hard time sleeping sometimes and no offense, but I went to sleep and <laughs> it was great, <laughs> right? It was complete relaxation. Mm. And, and is it true, because I've heard some people say, there, there, there are a lot of different thoughts on meditation, right? Mm. Some people will say you need to sit up, you don't wanna fall asleep because you want to be able to be present. And if you, but to me, it seems like if you fall asleep, oh well, you're still hearing something subconsciously, am I wrong? No, you're absolutely right. And so in fact, my most popular meditation class in the community is my lying down meditation, my Peace Within Guided Healing Meditation, which is a lying down meditation. I've been meditating 36 years, teaching and guiding, and I was told the same thing. My first 20 years of meditation practice was primarily seated meditation and keeping the spine straight, and I still do that, mm -hmm. and I still guide people in a very traditional practice of meditation, having your spine straight can be great. But actually, it was actually after Hurricane Ivan, I had a knee surgery, injury, and back injury where I couldn't sit in my usual posture. It was too painful So for almost two years. So I started exploring these lying down meditation practices from around the world. And I was so amazed, Sherry, that actually it improved my meditation. Mm -hmm. I went further, faster, deeper. And I also found that it was a great way to get beginners started. And like I mentioned, sleep itself is a meditation. Mm -hmm. Your brain is going to a very similar place. In, and we could talk about brain waves, and I, I love to talk about the science of meditation. But most simply, if you fall asleep, you're actually just going to a, a certain form of meditative state, and your body needs it. There's no doubt that the more you do it, the more you can kind of stay tacitly aware, but also be deeply relaxed. And I'm one of the few musicians who actually is very honored when somebody says, boy, <laughs> your meditation put, I mean, your music puts me right to sleep, mm -hmm. you know, and some musicians would be, you know, mm -hmm. really offended by that, but I, that's the goal. So um, I think it's a really wonderful thing when people are able to get that relaxed, they fall asleep. Mm -hmm. Well, and again, they're still hearing it, so it's it's entering into uh, what they're thinking about when they're asleep, and, and probably to go to sleep to something like that is better than thinking about your grocery list or what your husband said to you. Exactly. Or... And as you notice, I'm just part of the sciences, part of what's happening in the seven by seven meditation, it's what we call a somatic based meditation, which is a body based or sensation based. So when we are thinking about that grocery list or, you know, depression, we're usually obsessing about the past, anxiety, we're obsessing about the future and meditation is helping us be in the moment. So when we say things like come to your senses, senses are always in the here and now. So in the seven by seven meditation, I'm teaching you to, to bring your awareness into your fingertips, into your toes, into your feet. And that moves our literal brain activity from the frontal cortex of the brain, which is doing all the reflection mm -hmm. and kind of projecting time travel in the past and future, usually ruminating in a negative way, mm -hmm. to the sensory motor cortex, which is more global, more peaceful, and isn't full of thoughts. And so what it does is actually without trying to reduce his thinking and allows us just to relax, be in the body, kicks in the parasympathetic nervous system, you know, helps digestion. And j most importantly, it feels good. Mm. Yeah. And once you get into that state, then does the body have an intelligence that it can follow with even chronic illnesses and other issues that are physical? Can it, can it help with that? Absolutely. In fact, we know... Um, one of the people I've studied with, John Kabat-Zinn, has mindfulness-based stress reduction where he works with chronic pain people. And when I had my knee and my back injury, it really came in helpful. What's interesting about physical symptoms, and this sounds like a paradox, but the best way to perpetuate physical pain in a symptom is to obsessively think about it or try to get rid of it. So in meditation practice, like if, you know, when my right knee was hurting, I began focusing on my left knee. So what happens is we're actually distracting the body from its obsessive focus on the pain, which actually reduces it and over time can even eliminate it. So, so often, <laughs> I want to write a book one day called mm -hmm. The Do-Nothing Cure. Mm -hmm. And that's part of what meditation is, mm -hmm. the do-nothing cure. By not 
overdoing or trying to get rid of symptoms, symptoms reduce and oftentimes are eliminated. Yeah, that's that's so true. It, getting above it or it's just that mind-body mm -hmm. connection, exactly. Yeah, you've talked about teachers and how important a teacher has been for you. Um, I've heard other people. I talked to Prudence recently, and she talks about her um, Maharishi and how you know how important is that to have a spiritual guide to kind of help you in this process and if you can't afford one are there guides available to you as we've talked about online in different ways yes um, first off that having a teacher can be wonderful and um, I I really feel that it's important though it feels like a good fit for you um, and that this is something there is what we kind of call it you know um, sometimes a contact high or a transmission, just being with somebody who has been meditating a long time can sometimes help you get into that state a little bit more easily. That having been said, I really feel like it's so important in today's environment to also trust yourself. I'm wanting to help people connect with their own inner teacher, you know, their own inner guru, that you don't want to give your will away or your power away, and you want to always be, you know, that, that person, a good teacher should always be, you know, um, helping you become autonomous and free. Even Buddha said, a good teacher should help hold the lantern to the light of your own heart. And so the idea is it should be helping free you to become more autonomous, independent, and not dependent. Um, that having been said, there's also some great you know, apps and YouTube videos, and I think there's time now than ever before where you can do so much of it on your own. To me, if you get stuck though, finding a teacher to get you through those points of stuckness, particularly because some aspects of meditation can bring up feelings. And my community meditation class is a wonderful example that a lot of times when people first come, they will be extremely relaxed and I'll notice tears just running down their face and they'll come up afterwards and say, oh, I just, I must be doing something wrong. I cried through the whole meditation. And he said, but I really feel so much better. And I said, no, that's very normal because you realize why you are chronically doing and obsessed. Because if you stop, all of these feelings you're avoiding come up. And that's oftentimes why some people won't stop and meditate. But if they keep coming, it's not therapy. I'm not doing or interpreting anything, but just simply normalizing. Then all of a sudden within three, four times, all of a sudden it's like I say, you know, just keep breathing breathing through it, be often with meditation where we're actually allowing whatever's there to come into our awareness, pass through it, and dissolve, like clouds floating by. And that in and of itself becomes healing. So a lot of people will say, I don't even know why I'm crying, all I know is I do. And sometimes it all of a sudden it's like they feel a sense of joy. But having a teacher to normalize it, help you make sense of it, that they've been through similar spots and places, because it does open and awaken um, who you are at the deepest level. Mm -hmm. And maybe just having um, someone to say, okay, let's start here. Yes. Um, I think that can be highly valuable. Absolutely. We'll, uh, we'll continue this discussion more on meditation, including how you can make it every, uh, every day, part of your life when In Studio returns. You're watching WSRE TV. We'll be back right after this break. Thank you to everyone who came out and made WSRE's annual Be My Neighbor Day such a terrific success. studio on WSRE-TV, PBS for the Gulf Coast. Our topic, 
meditation. Our special guest, Dr. Michael DiMaria, and Michael is now being joined by two of his past and current students. Now, both of these ladies have participated in his community meditations and the entire Peace Within Process training. We welcome to our discussion Lindsay Windrow. Lindsay is a therapeutic educational consultant in our area, a registered yoga teacher and integrative wellness guide, and Kate Daudrill. Kate is an artist, urban farmer, and public speaker. She also assists Michael DiMaria with his social media presence sometimes, and Kate has studied extensively with Michael DiMaria as well. So in other words, these are two very dedicated meditators, and we welcome both of you ladies and appreciate you coming on the show, on the broadcast. Thank you. Nice yeah, it's to a have pleasure you to be here. Good. And we wanted you to come on because we've been saying meditation is for everyone. And, and so I'd love for you to talk about your experience with meditation. Are you so different than the average person that, that you just can meditate and someone else can't? Or how, is it, how, how did you get involved? Definitely. Well, yeah. I had a liberal arts education and have always loved thinking and ideas and writing, and so I have a lot of energy up in my head. Um, and as I started to meditate, which I came to it through yoga at first, and then got more interested also in seated meditation and the laying down meditation. But as I started to meditate, I started to feel the energy moving from my head and all of these excessive thoughts just into my body and into my heart a little bit more. So I actually started to feel more comfortable in my body because there wasn't this excess amount of thinking and analyzing going on in my mind. So I think when we just practice, even for the seven minutes, calming the mind, the mind just learns that pattern to throughout the day stay a little calmer. You don't need to have five thoughts while the person's talking. Maybe just listen and be still. So that's been part of my experience of dropping the energy from my brain into my heart and my body where it can feel more peaceful. Some people call that grounding, maybe. Um, yeah? Yeah. Mm -hmm. Lindsay, what about you? Yeah, I mean, similar to Kate, it's, um, for me, it's a process of moving beyond my thoughts to a, a place of serenity um, where my thoughts are there, but they're not in control of my being. Um, instead, I'm connected to that heart center and to this area of, this vast area, this, this space, you know, allowing for so many different channels to be open, like creativity. Um, and it's a place of helping me be able to think more clearly, because from that space of um, expansiveness and, and heart-centeredness, my thoughts become affected by that, so that I'm able to see more clearly, I feel. Um, and, and yes, I mean, it has, uh, for meditation for me has so many benefits. Um, I was thinking um, while I was listening to um, the first part of the show that after Michael's meditation classes, whether it's at Sanders Beach or in Heart Warrior training where we do a lot of meditation, when I get home and I go to bed, I mean, I am just so relaxed mm -hmm. and I sleep so soundly. Um, my dreams are more vivid. So, I mean, it has, uh, it, it has very powerful effects on many different levels. Is it safe to say that it's changed both of your lives, Kate? Oh, absolutely. I feel so much more at home in my body. I just feel more comfortable. I feel like I can feel feelings more deeply. I think I just feel more present. And I mean, I'm a gardener as well. I have an urban farm. And so as I garden, as I cook, as I interact with neighbors, there's like a joy and a pleasure when you're just fully in yourself. And I've found that I can garden and think about my to-do list, but by just having that small meditative intention of let me just fully experience this, I can smell things more deeply, I can feel touch more profoundly, I, I just experience life in a more, to me, beautiful and deep way. Well, Michael was saying, Lindsay, that um, typically when we're depressed or anxious, it's because we're thinking about the past or we're thinking about the future. Um, do you find that this present moment awareness is, is uh, very helpful? Definitely. It, it, de it definitely is. It, it just, um, when you're focused, when you're being present and you're, you're focused on just what is happening right now um, and you're more connected to your body, 
I think that um, those other depression, anxiety, it, it just it, it fades away. Michael, are these pretty typical responses that you get from people that have either taken your courses or been in your meditation classes? Or well, not so articulate, but yes, <laughs> the, the content mm -hmm. is for sure. I mean, it's just it continues to amaze me. And I remember even you know at eighteen when I first started to meditate and how started just to change pretty quickly, you know, in terms of just finding myself more present in whatever it was I was doing. And, and they both mentioned that. And I, and that, you know, it comes to this idea that it can really improve whatever you're doing. You know, you can meditate while you're doing the dishes. You can meditate when you're running. You can meditate when you're riding the bike. You can meditate when you're gardening. Um, you can, it can deepen your sleep because you do a form of meditation while you're before you sleep by just doing some deep breathing and doing a body scan and a progressive relaxation. So it's it's a way of really beginning to not only get to know yourself but your mind. Mm -hmm. You know, one of our, you know, and actually Lindsay's worked with my teacher, Dr. Bill Michaelis as well, and his mm -hmm. most recent book is Taming the Drunken Monkey. Mm -hmm. And so, you know, there's the old saying that our mind untrained with meditation is like a drunken monkey. And I think there's, I think, I <laughs> to hit the break too, I have some people who start meditating going, I don't know if I like this, Michael. It feels like being locked in a phone booth with a crazy person. I don't think I want to know myself this uh -huh. well. Yeah. Um, it, that's a typical beginning response because when we first start looking within and quieting our minds, we see how unruly that mind is. Mm -hmm. And yet pretty quickly, particularly with certain kinds of practices, you can learn to tame that drunken monkey or occupy that drunken monkey with an, you know, an activity, whether watching the breath or listening to music or doing a body scan, where you touch, and I, I liked when Lindsay said that, more expansive awareness. And so it's not only present moment awareness, but it's a vast spaciousness. When I talk to the ocean of peace, it's all of a sudden, the biggest misconception around meditation, and they both mentioned this, is that, um, that it's not stopping your thoughts. They both shared very articulately that it's stepping back from the contents of your conscious, what you're thinking, feeling, doing, tasting, touching. That it's creating some spaciousness, like Lindsay said, around what's happening in this moment. And so just like as an artist, we talk about looking at negative space, you know, or the figure versus ground, like right now, even in this room, if we focus on the space, and not the table or our bodies, all of a sudden our consciousness shifts. And that's part of what meditation is doing, is looking at the space around the thoughts, mm -hmm. the space around the feelings. And something really powerful begins to happen. And we see it neurologically to MRIs of people meditating and the, the frontal cortex goes offline and this whole other more spacious open awareness opens up, which we see in creative thinking. But even a beginning meditator, literally it changes your mind. Mm -hmm. And practically, I feel like that negative space can sometimes feel like instead of the emotion being right here and being overwhelmed by it, suddenly the emotion's like right here. Right. So you might still know it's around, but you're able to kind of look at it and it doesn't feel like it's taking over your energy. You're able to be like, oh, that's happening. Now let me reflect and make a wise decision of yeah. right. how to respond to it. So uh, maybe a lack of responsiveness um, can be achieved through meditation by stepping back and, and being the observer more? Yeah, yeah. and I think um, the more you meditate too, you're able to be more aware of the triggers too mm -hmm. that affect those emotions or that stimulate those emotions so that you can catch the emotion quicker, um, sooner in the process um, so that it doesn't become so overwhelming. So, I mean, there's so many um, practical ways that med meditation can really help you by providing that distance. You know, like Kate was saying, the emotion is here instead of right here, you know, where it's totally overwhelming us. <clears throat> I hear you saying it can help with um, all kinds of relationships with other people. Oh, definitely. And I think one of the cool things about Michael's Peace Within process is in that is that it doesn't just have to be you go and you sit or you lay down for 15 minutes or an hour. That he teaches, and you've taught me, a lot of meditative moments that can mm -hmm. literally take just a second. If I am triggered in a relationship or I'm having a strong feeling, I with the release you talked about, the, just the sighing in and the, 
<sighs> I do that about 10 times a day. And people sometimes be like, what's she doing? But I do it. And then all of a sudden I'm like, oh, I'm and it here. works. I'm yeah. back. Mm -hmm. So I think just in terms of being able to fully show up in moments with people, if I find myself not, I can like take a sigh and then laugh and suddenly my full presence yeah. is more there. And, and just to, to add on to that, I think that just cultivating that meditative stance in all aspects of your life can really affect your um, relationships with your children, with yeah. your coworkers, with your spouse, mm -hmm. um, in very powerful ways. Mm -hmm and make us more productive, we've talked about that. So it, it, there's almost like no good reason not to meditate. <laughs> yes, I can't argue with that statement. Yeah. Um, and just, you know, and they, they both mentioned one of the powerful things about meditation, it teaches you to be a better listener yes. and do this deep, active yes. listening, partly because we're doing it with ourselves, but then we learn to do that with others because then we're more present with them. And it's not really what triggers us often is not our feelings and emotions, but our relationship to mm -hmm. our feelings and emotions. Mm -hmm. So how, we're, how we are working with them. And it's not our thoughts, but our relationship to our thoughts. Mm -hmm. And meditation really helps us mm -hmm. become more skillful at maneuvering that stream of consciousness that includes thoughts, feelings, and sensations. So we're not our thoughts is what I'm hearing. Yes. I get chill bumps when you say that. That's, that's a big key point mm -hmm. um, is that you're not who you think you are. And the mantra I, I love to teach that will change, you know, anybody listening out there, your life is, I am not my thoughts. My thoughts are not reality. So that little mantra, because most people, that's a huge, like, aha. What do you mean? I'm not my thoughts. Of course, I'm my, not my, th I'm, of course, I'm my thoughts. But if people can really get that that starts working on you. And then all of a sudden you realize that constant stream of Barrage. thoughts is totally conditioned from yeah. a lifetime of school. And you came into this world without a thought or a word and you lived there for three years and pretty blissful, mm -hmm. <laughs> what, what I call amnes, mm -hmm. um, which is there was no ego, there was no I. And the self is really what causes most of our struggles and pain. Right. Um, so meditation helps you get to that place where you are not your thoughts, but you are the awareness of your thoughts passing through your consciousness. So you can let the thoughts go by and you can look at them and realize that's not you. That's right. right. They're just like clouds. Like, that's interesting right. thought. Are we all, when we're in a meditative state, are we all going to the same place inside ourselves? Is it all somehow connected? And we don't have much time for that big question, but <laughs> that's a big do question. you get that feeling? That maybe maybe you're able to relate to others better because you know we're kind of. I think so. I think that there's a universal meditative state, yeah, and that our own meditative state is connected to that universal meditative mm -hmm. state. Or that's part of what intimacy is. Like when you're yeah. fully present in you and they are, and you look in someone's eyes, like you're in a meditation mm -hmm. and you're in it together. So maybe that's part yeah. of that energy of oneness. Oh. That's really nice. Well, we will continue our in-studio discussion. Meditation goes mainstream right after this quick break. Stick around because Dr. DeMaria may just lead all of us in a guided meditation. You're watching PBS for the Gulf Coast. This is In Studio on WSRE-TV. We've been discussing the benefits of meditation with Dr. Michael DeMaria and two of his past and current students, Lindsay Windrow and Kate Daudrill. 
So we, during the break, we're just discussing, have we described what the difference between mindfulness and meditation is, or is it all mixed together, or what's the, what's the short answer to that? So they are different, um, or I should say mindfulness is a form of meditation. There's two main kinds of meditation practices. One is concentration practice, and one is mindfulness practice. So concentration is really when we've been talking about training the mind to be focused in attending to one object. That could be the breath, it could be a candle, it could be a mantra, it could be um, like when I was doing my sound based with my piano as a kid. Mindfulness, you hear so much about, Time Magazine, a few years ago on their cover said the mindfulness revolution is here. So mindfulness, and I have my mindful moments with Michael, is more of a global sense of, said most simply, simply mindfulness is present moment, non-judgmental awareness of simply what is. So when I'm talking about, you know, meditating while you're doing the dishes, it's really actually a mindful meditation. So I'm not focusing a particular object, but I'm allowing myself to be fully present to an activity. So right now we're doing mindful listening. So this can be a meditation practice. If I'm allowing myself to be fully present, I'm not in the past, I'm not in the future, I am right here now, non-judgmentally with you, we can have a mindful, well, we've been having a very <laughs> mindful meditative sharing forum. Mm -hmm. So mindfulness is once again, non-judgmental, present moment, awareness of simply what is. The other kind of meditation is we're very specifically trying to train the mind into one-pointedness on one object or activity. And that's going deep within correct. where all those other thoughts can float by, correct? Dissolve, just mm -hmm. like clouds floating by. Yeah. Have you run into friends, anybody saying, meditation is weird or where, where are you? Have you had any pushback at all? I've, I, I know I've heard people from time to time say, you know, be careful with that, you, you know, and, and, and think of it as something that might be religious or something that's not uh, a place you should go. Or, I mean, it scares some people. And, and I'd like to open that up and, and say, um, how, why should it not scare people and it's not a religion is it or is it a health practice honestly it's not I want to say most simply and I would love for Lindsay and Kate to say their experience so meditation as we've been talking about it does not require you to believe anything do anything perform anything it is not a religion it is a practice within some traditions but it is primarily um, a form of quieting the mind and opening the heart and releasing attachments and addictions. Mm -hmm. So it's, it's, a, it's a practice. It is not a religion, very, very clearly. It does not require you to believe anything. Mm -hmm. um, and it can also be done within any con um, uh, context. Some religions do have forms of meditation, mm -hmm. but meditation in and of itself is not a religion. And Mother Teresa meditated, right? A contemplative prayer would be? Yeah, it's a form of, uh, just real quickly, mm -hmm. I loved her description when they asked her, well, m you know, Mother Teresa, how do you meditate, or how do you pray? Mm -hmm. And she said, well, it's kind of like listening to God. God yeah. And they said, well, what does God say? Mm -hmm. And she goes, well, it's kind of weird. It's like God listens too. So mm -hmm. it's listening to listening. Mm -hmm. and, and she certainly got a lot done. Oh by doing that. Isn't that the truth? How about you? Well, I, I think you were asking originally, um, do our friend, what do our friends think about meditation? Well, most of my, <laughs> most of my friends like mm -hmm. and understand mm -hmm. meditation, mm -hmm. but I have found over the years that it seemed weird to people maybe 10, 20 years ago, not so weird anymore. I think it's, it, is, it definitely is becoming more mainstream and accepted. Yeah. Which, I, which is a good thing. Yeah, and how about, Kate, I, I mean, I've even, we're getting ready to do a, a quick meditation, if there's such a thing, but, um, I mean, we're even seeing meditation on the Today Show, yeah. and we're seeing it all over the place, right? Oh, definitely. I mean, even scrolling on Instagram, and I do follow some more mindful people, mm -hmm. but... I'm seeing people offering meditative moments even on Instagram saying that we realize that the way that we're living and we're just giving our attention away to so much information all day and more and more people I think are starting to feel 
unhinged by that and overwhelmed. And so I think it's this medicine that we all need right now and we're all drawn to it or more of us are drawn to it because it actually makes us feel better. We talk about the state of the world and we, we get up there and we worry about it and th this can help. Absolutely. Mm -hmm. <clears throat> I mean, there's a way in which um, one of the best things we can do, what's the, there's a great description, uh, I don't know if it was Gandhi who, who said, you know, um, there's um, two ways to, to change the world or make it more comfortable. One is try to carpet the entire world. The other is to wear sandals. Yeah. And <clears throat> the idea of, of trying to find peace within before you try to create peace without, if you're not making or doing things from a place of peace within, you often can add to the problems mm -hmm. and difficulties and become the very monster you're trying to fight. Mm -hmm. And this is a huge challenge and that's why, you know, you know, for me in my meditative practice, it's the first thing I can do is, you know, start with peace within myself and then I can be a vehicle for that peace in the kinds of things that I do in the world. And I do believe in activism. But if you're not doing it from a place of peace, number one, you're going to burn out mm -hmm. and you may end up making more harm than good. I mean, Hitler's a perfect example of somebody who tried to change the world and make it a better place, but he was a mess inside. Mm -hmm. And so he created a mess outside. Yeah. We don't have a lot of time, but could you take us on a bit of a guided meditation, even a short one minute? And, and, in, and the viewers too, I'd love for you to listen to Michael for a few minutes and join Lindsay and Kate and myself and I would love to yeah. and it's it's my favorite I mentioned this already three breaths to de-stress and you can do this with your eyes closed or open um, but it is amazing just closing the eyes tends to reduce brain activity by two-thirds because it takes mm. so much brain activity to process visual information mm. so if I'm you my eyes. close your <laughs> eyes what we're gonna do is take a deep breath in through the nose we're gonna breathe out the mouth and we're gonna breathe out until there is no breath left at all okay and then just wait just a moment and I'll guide you okay so and everybody out there in TV land mm -hmm. you can do this with us mm -hmm. so close your eyes take a nice deep breath breathing in your nose breathing out your mouth very slowly And when you feel you can't blow out any more, blow out a little bit more. Take another deep breath in, breathing in. Breathing out. And when you feel you can't breathe out any farther, just breathe out a little more. One more time, nice and deep, breathing in. Breathing out the mouth. A little further. Now breathe in naturally. Keeping your eyes closed. Just bring yourself to the awareness of the points of contact between your body and the chair you're sitting on or the couch. Neither the body nor the couch or the chair, but that point of contact and see if you can just allow yourself to rest and allow gravity to hold you to the earth. And I want you to imagine breathing in from the tips of the toes up to the top of the head. And breathe out from the top of the head all the way down to the tips of the toes. And just noticing how differently you feel in your body at the moment. Be a little more centered, a little more grounded, a little more peaceful. And then on your next in-breath, just slowly opening your eyes. And just notice how differently you feel in your body. I mean, just all of a sudden, we're in a new place. Absolutely. Right? I was, was going to stay there. Yeah. <laughs> I, like, I stay there about two hours a yeah. day. Got a, <laughs> got, a, got a show to do, though. And we were saying yeah. earlier that some people will say, oh, I don't have time to meditate. What do you say to that? Um, if you can't have time to do 20 minutes, you need to be doing 40. Mm -hmm. And it is amazing because it's the drunken monkey that's trying to keep you 
from quieting your mind because the drunken monkey knows it won't be running the show anymore. Mm -hmm. It'll be out of a job. Right. <laughs> <laughs> Some final thoughts from you on meditation. What, what would you say to our viewers? Just do it. Mm. Don't let that drunken monkey talk you out of it or don't let life get in the way. Just do it. And I would say to try different kinds. Like that there's so many types. There's laying down, there's seated, there's the three breaths, there's two minute meditation. So come to Michael's classes, you know, find other meditation teachers, go online, get apps for mindfulness, but there's just so many ways. So find something that fits for you. And all of that, you've made part of your mission. You've made so much of it free and available to people. Um, Absolutely. I mean, we just, we need, to me, it's, it's a chance to change the world because we have to move from doing to being. And as soon as you really quiet your mind and you open your heart, you had mentioned, do we all go to the same place? So there's two Native American sayings. One is ho uh, metakawasan, um, which is a greeting, and it means we are all related. And they didn't mean just to all human beings. They meant to the trees and the rocks and the four-legged and the, the, the feathered people and the fin people, meaning that we're all part of one web of interconnectedness. The other is the Blackfoot saying their greeting means literally, how are your connections? Mm -hmm. You know, and I love that because we talk about the connected breath. And when we really begin to breathe and quiet and connect, we realize our interconnectedness. Um, one of the things that scared the native people of this country when we came were two things. And the first one was that the white man mm -hmm. wasn't aware of his breath. And they knew somebody who wasn't aware of their breath and breathing deeply was insane. Mm. <laughs> and the other was they thought crying was a weakness. No. And they knew somebody who thought crying was a weakness would have no mercy. Mm -hmm. So by quieting our minds, deepening our breath, and opening our hearts, we become sane in the mm. genuine way we all need today. Mm. Mm. That's amazing. Oh, I just can't encourage people enough to look into it more and appreciate you coming on, both of you taking time to share your experiences with our viewers, and thank you for all that you do. My pleasure, and we'll Sherry. Thank you for having, you for having yeah. us. Absolutely. It's an we'll honor look, to be here. Thank you. We look forward to some follow-up on this as well. <laughs> well, we've been discussing meditation, specifically meditation becoming more mainstream. Our special guests for this broadcast, Dr. Michael DiMaria, Lindsay Windrow, and Kate Dodrell. Now, for more information, you can check out Dr. DiMaria's website, and there's an online program at alldaypeace.com. There's also a free meditation challenge available at youtube.com slash mbdemaria. We're putting those up on the screen for you. Also, two monthly community meditation and yoga classes are offered at Sanders Beach Community Center in Pensacola. Now, details for those are available at and on the City of Pensacola's website. In conclusion, it's widely held, even scientifically proven, that meditation will improve absolutely everything we do. And it's never been easier to find all the tools you need to support your meditation practice. So it's safe to say, the more mainstream meditation becomes, the healthier our culture will collectively be. I'm Sherry Hemminghouse Weeks. You've been watching in studio on WSRE-TV. We'll see you next time.